So let's bow in. Nice to see everyone here. Welcome to the profound treasury of the ocean of Dharma, the Buddhist path of awakening course. We are working our way through the three volumes of the profound treasury of the ocean of Dharma by Chögyam Trungpa. These are talks that have been digested. <clears throat> they were given over a period of 13 years, I think. And um, every year, Trungpa Rinpoche would take 150 to 250 students away into retreat for about three months. And during that time, they would practice and study and have different periods of practice and study. <laughs> Sometimes it would be just pure practice and for about 10 days and then they'd study for some period of time and then go back to practice and whenever they studied they were always practicing as well but um, mixing it in with classes that were given not only by him but by his senior students uh, during the day and then he would give a talk each night. Those talks were sometimes given in the normal hours you might expect like at 7.30, 8 o'clock. Sometimes he gave talks at 1, 2 in the morning. And one year he was even giving talks at 5, 6 a.m., <laughs> completely turning night and day up and down. But this went on for about 13 years, and these talks, each uh, month he gave a different set of t teachings. In the first month he would give the Hinayana teachings, that means the teachings of the lesser vehicle, the preliminary or foundational vehicle, as he preferred to call it. In the second month, the teachings on the greater vehicle, the Mahayana. And in the third month, the teachings on the Vajrayana, the adamantine or indestructible vehicle, uh, also called the Tantrayana or Mantrayana. We are, are working our way, we're almost finished actually, um, with the second volume, the Mahayana. And in a few weeks, we'll be going into the third, the Vajrayana. We'll see how far we get <laughs> before we find it too difficult, if we do. But I know that we're going to enjoy the first part of that volume a lot. So tonight, um, we are working on chapter 46 which deals with the second through the 10th Bhumis. Now, what this means is that the Mahayana path, which is the middle path of our progress as practitioners toward enlightenment, um, is divided into 10 stages. Another scheme has it divided into five paths. These 10 stages are called the 10 Bhumis in Sanskrit, Bhumi, Sa in Tibetan. Bhumi and Sa both mean the same thing. They mean stage or they mean ground or even literally earth in Tibetan. And we are, last week Michael presented the first Bhumi, Pramudita, it's called in Sanskrit, Great Joy. And the chapter that we're working on now, which is quite long, deals with the second through 10th Bhumis. And we're going to deal with about half of that chapter. We're going to cover the second through the seventh Bhumis. So about six, leaving the eighth, ninth, and tenth for next week. And then there's a final chapter on the eleventh Bhumi, sometimes called the eleventh Bhumi, which is actually the stage of enlightenment itself and the entrance into the Vajrayana. The bodhisattva, the person, the practitioner, the person treading the path is called a bodhisattva at this stage of the path. In the beginning, they were just an ordinary practitioner like you or I, working 
uh, towards what is called individual salvation, meaning freedom from suffering. And that was our motivation. That's our motivation to even approach the path. Um, this is the first noble truth that the Buddha taught, the very first teaching out of his mouth after he achieved enlightenment at Bodh Gaya 2,600 years ago. The first teaching was the truth of suffering, that we all suffer, and that this is the real motivation for treading the Buddhist path, the path to enlightenment, is to be achieve relief from suffering, or at least it's the initial motivation. And it's the motivation of the first stage of the path, the Hinayana, the lesser vehicle, the foundational vehicle. As we progress through the Hinayana, we begin to make discoveries. And really what we're discovering is the truth of the three marks of existence. This is another teaching by the early teaching by the Buddha, foundational teaching. The three marks of existence are the truth of suffering, that suffering exists, and it does, of course. We all know this. Disease, we get old, we, have, we are unhappy in our minds, our bodies, whatever it might be, all kinds of unhappiness. The truth, the second uh, truth is the truth of impermanence. And that has actually two interpretations. The first is that everything that we encounter, these bodies, this chair that I'm sitting in, whatever it is, the weather, all changes. This body decays and goes back to being dust. Um, cars rust. The weather changes instant to instant. This is the first meaning of impermanence. But the second and more profound meaning of impermanence is that in our field of perception right now, right where we sit, everything that is presented to us is constantly changing. These words that you're hearing come out of this mouth and disappear. This gesture is made and is gone. All of the so-called six knowables, these are objects of sight, sounds, smells, tastes, bodily sensations like touch your chest, and mental events, thoughts and emotions. All of these in the instant are arising and passing away just like that. So fast, you can't even say they were here. You can't point to anything that endures for even a split second. It's a constant and ever-changing display of these six objects of perception. That's the second truth. And the third truth is that what we think of as an I, me, does not exist. It's a fiction, literally. It's a story that we tell ourselves from time to time. But when we come back to awareness, there's just this, the computer screen that you're looking at, the sounds that you're hearing, the feeling of your body as it sits in the chair or on the cushion. All of this is arising and passing away in the moment. And I is just a statement a story that comes and goes. And that story um, is fraught, fraught with tension, unhappiness, suffering, the fear, worry about one's own existence, which is ironic since <laughs> what the teachings are saying is there is no existence for oneself, that it's all a myth. Or as Trumper Rinpoche once bellowed at me, a lie. It's not true. What's true is this, and it's beyond words. It's arising and passing away in the moment. It's the best thing you can say about it. It's full of color and shape and form and sensation, the six knowables. They each have their own qualities, but they come and go so rapidly. You can't grasp them. It's like water passing through your fingers. But we get stuck in these stories about I, and that really is the very foundation of our suffering that we believe and we cling to. I clings to I. 
We hold on to it. We dream about it all the time. Not all the time, but a lot of the time. We constantly come back to the stream of I and other and our hopes and our fears um, and our anxieties and our happinesses, they're all so temporary, fleeting, coming and going. So the first yana is really about coming to the understanding that this I is just a fiction and beginning to live in awareness in this present moment instead of lost in dreams about I, the melodramas that we conjure in our head, the stories um, about the hope and fear of I, the success and failure of I, the happiness and suffering of I. I is the constant hero or heroine in these melodramas that play out from time to time a lot in our minds. And we begin to come awake from that begin to come and begin to realize that this right now is the real world. And the world of I is just a fiction, a creation, like a television drama written for TV. Only the TV is here, it's in our minds. So the end of the Hinayana path, that first stage of the path, is really the discovery of the full discovery of the absence of I. And that is the beginning of the second stage of the path, the Mahayana, the greater vehicle. And this is the path of what is called the Bodhisattva. Bodhisattva literally means, Bodhi means awake, Sattva means being. So it's the awake being. And what have they awoken to? They've awoken to the reality of egolessness, I that I does not exist, and that the world is very different without I. In fact, what they've really woken, awoken to is what's called the twofold egolessness. You see, as soon as you believe in an I, you also believe in other. I is always in relationship with other, painful relationships with other, or if they're pleasurable relationships with other, they contain that seed of pain within them because you know that they won't last. They'll change. They'll go into something less pleasurable or even painful. And so uh, what the Mahayana stage of the path is about is discovering that not only does I not exist, but ego, but excuse me, but other is also a creation of confusion, of mind. In other words, it's like this. We live in this space in which everything is arising and passing, the colors, these gestures that you're looking at on your computer screen, these sounds, the world around you as you sit here watching this. This is all arising and passing away, but from time to time, and those times are pretty frequent, an object emerges as being more important, like these words, like this image of a teacher, so-called. And we say, ah, that's the focus. And if that's there, then I am here, listening, watching. I am the observer. So it's other and then I. This is the way in which confusion is born, samsara, unenlightenment. Suddenly, there is an object which emerges from this field, this flux, of sensations and visual objects and sounds and all the rest. And it emerges as a figure and everything else recedes into ground. And we say, ooh, that's important. I ought to listen to that. I ought to listen to that. And there is this relationship between the other, which has now emerged, and this, the observer. Now you can never see the observer because if you do, it becomes another other. It always, and you've got a new observer now, but it's implied that observer. You can never find it. The only way that you can sort of keep the observer alive is to keep going back and forth, back and forth. If that's there, therefore I must be here. And when we do that, we make a relationship with that other. That relationship is, again, fraught. It's either positive, negative, 
or neutral. If it's positive, that means the other is something we want, something that we feel augments my existence. And so we want to pull it to me. That's desire, passion. If we feel like it's inimical, like it's threatening, like it's unpleasant to me, we want to push it away. That's aggression, hatred. And if we feel that it's indifferent to us, neutral, then we just ignore it. And that's called ignoring. These are called the three poisons. What happens is that at the end of the Hinayana path and the entrance into the Mahayana, which Michael described last week, we begin to realize that this whole game of I and other is just that, a game, a fiction, a story that we tell ourselves from time to time and which we can let go of because it's full of unhappiness. It's full of hatred and passion and unresolved feelings of what's going to happen to my existence, which is a dream. This is what's real right now. It's the only thing we ever have. It's beginningless and endless. But we tell ourselves stories that have beginnings and ends about me, this fictional I, the hero or the heroine of the story. So the entrance into the Mahayana path is the beginning of realizing that I and other are just fictions, or as Rinpoche said, lies. They are not true. The only thing that is true is this right now, what you can see, feel, hear, smell, touch, and think. Those thoughts, all these as they come and go, the stories are not real, but the thoughts and the mental events, they happen. Just like these words, just like this gesture, that sound. It's all arising and passing in the moment. And so the Bodhisattva is discovering the lack of existence, true existence of I, me, and all the things that I relate to that I feel are so important to my continued well-being. They're just mental creations that don't actually have any true existence. By true existence, we mean they don't endure through time. They're only presentations in this moment. They are not unitary, one thing. Everything is a constant interplay of everything else. Everything is a constant dependent mixture. This words, this sweater, everything, you see it and it's a part of this matrix. And the third thing is that uh, nothing lives as one thing or independently. I sort of mixed the two up. One thing is or independently. But everything is a constant changing interplay constantly melding and coming apart and coming together so fast you can't even find what it was that went by except in memory which is just a dream so we begin to enter into what's called the world of shunyata shunyata is a sanskrit word it means emptiness and what it's talking about is being empty of these fictions of thought, of I and other, these stories. And when those go, the, the person, the bodhisattva, the awakened being, he's awakened, he, she, awakened to this emptiness, begins to see the world in a very, very different way. Not in terms of these projects and stories, like my life and my well-being and my happiness and my lovers and my successes and my failures and all that, but rather in terms of a constant arising and passing away in the present moment and a constant opportunity for creative action now. The only time we ever have. Absent I and other. That's what is absent in the emptiness of shunyata. It's empty of the I and other the true existence, they don't happen. They're just words, pointers, that point to something that's gone as soon as it's even pointed to.
this is called shunyata, there's a flip side to shunyata, this emptiness. Because when the world is empty of the dreams, then this presentation as it arises in the present moment is seen much more clearly because it's stripped, we've stripped it of these overlays of hope and fear, interpretations of good and bad. All those thoughts, oh, I hope that this happens, suddenly we're gone, we're in the future. Oh, I'm afraid that that will happen again, we're, all, we're gone. Oh, I don't want what happened in the past to happen now. All of these are dreams, and when we are engaged in those dreams, we're not fully present. We're lost in a dream. It's like sometimes people get so lost in dreams that you could stand next to them and call their name and they don't hear you because they're lost in the dream. Some anxious or frightened dream especially has that quality. So the Bodhisattva, the awakened being, is awakening from those dreams. And what happens is that as they awaken, this world, as it arises now, becomes much more vivid because it's stripped. We've stripped away these graying out, these filters of dream. When we're lost in dream, we, we could become almost catatonic. Someone might call our name and we wouldn't hear them because we're so into the dream. Likewise, we walk down the street and we barely might see you know, what, what's going on on the street because we're so lost in some dream, some frightened, uh, anxious dream about the future. But when we become come back into shunyata and begin to let those dreams of I and other go, because we know we are beginning to awaken from the myth of I and other, then the world emerges much more vividly. So there's a fullness inside this emptiness, you might say, or revealed by the emptiness the lack of I and other and all the stories that go with them. And that fullness is very, very important. It only grows as we progress along the Bodhisattva path. And in fact, it's really the precursor and the entrance into the third path, the Vajrayana, which is all about, all about the fullness, the beauty, the vividness, the, the incredible power and significance and a meaning of this world as it arises only now. Now, there's a doctrine that we've discussed before, but I'm going to talk about it again, called the two truths. The two truths are the absolute and the relative truth. The absolute truth is what I've been talking about, really. It's shunyata. It's the emptiness. It's the fact that nothing has any true existence, especially I. I is a total fiction. But even other, you know, like this gong clapper, it's just a sensation in my hand that comes and goes. It's gone. In the moment. These, this is the way the whole world arises and passes. And this is the absolute truth, that nothing has any true being. The relative truth is that while nothing has any true being, there are these things, this gong clapper, which appear but have no true being, and yet they appear. They appear momentarily in the instant, and then they're gone. It's gone. These words, they appear, and yet they're gone. So the absolute truth is part and parcel with the relative truth. The relative truth has, is about, all about phenomena sights, sounds, smells, tastes, bodily sensations, and mental events, all arising and passing away in the instant. Now, that's the relative truth. Now, there are two kinds of relative truth. What I've been describing so far is what's called the true relative truth. It's the phenomenal world that has no true being. Because why? Because it's part of the absolute. Absolute means that there's nothing that exists. It's a continual flexing in which you can't find anything. The relative is that while nothing exists, you can talk about the nothing that it doesn't exist. <laughs> these words, these gestures, 
these visions. They have no true existence, and yet we can point to them and say, so there's a slogan um, in the tantras that sometimes we, we would chant, things don't exist, and yet they arise. They arise, and yet they don't exist. These are the two truths, absolute and relative. They are in complete union. You can't talk about the absolute truth unless you describe how the relative truth has no true existence. And yet, what is it that has no true existence? This constant appearing, the pink cheeks, the white beard, the blue sweater, whatever it might be, <laughs> the feeling of the chair on your bottom or the cushion, whatever you're sitting on. There's a third category, and that's the false relative truth. And that is where unenlightened people live. The false relative truth says, oh yeah, here's my gong clapper. I bought this five years ago, 10 years ago. Um, I like it a lot. Um, I hope it lasts for a long time. And we've got this story about the past and the future, about my gong clapper, about me. I was born 77 years ago. Now I'm telling you the, <laughs> my age, and who knows? I've got friends around me dying all the time. So life is coming to an end at some point. Then we tell these stories about ourselves. And in when we do this, we turn ourselves and our world, the gong clapper, into existent things in these stories. This is called the false relative. And it's confusing. It's all part and parcel of confusion. Unenlightened beings live in the world of the false relative truth. They don't even know about the absolute truth, much less the true relative truth, which is that everything is passing away in the present moment. They live in a world of things which endure over time and have independent existence, all of which is false. So there are these three categories, the absolute, and true relative, which are in complete union. And yet we can talk about them from different angles. And then the false relative truth, which is where unenlightened people live. The entrance into the Mahayana is the discovery of the absolute truth and of the true relative. But the emphasis is on the absolute, that nothing has any true existence. This is the the discovery of shunyata. Shunya means empty. Ta is a nominative. It turns it into a noun. So it's emptiness. The Tibetan is tongni, means the exact same thing. And what is it empty of? It's empty of all these stories of I and other. So this is the first Bhumi. It's called great joy. And the reason it's great joy is that this is the discovery of freedom. Freedom from the myths of I and other. Freedom from suffering. Tremendous joy. Hurrah! The world is completely different than I thought it was, literally thought it was. It's what it, the world lives beyond thought. And I do and everything else. And there is no I and there is no other. <laughs> There's just this constant, ever-changing display. This is the great joy of the first Bhumi, the Bodhisattva. It's the release from the games of ego, from these lies, these stories that bind us and enslave us and make us suffer. And the thing about it is, though, that the Bodhisattva is still not enlightened. They haven't gotten quite there yet. They're on the way. And this is a huge uh, accomplishment, really, this discovery of egolessness, of shunyata. And the, at the same time, it's such a jolt. It's such a contrast. And this is what creates the great joy. You know, because release, <laughs> freedom uh, from this terrible myth. And that very contrast 
becomes another subtle form of suffering. Because when you appreciate freedom, freedom from suffering, then the suffering still has to be there by contrast. You see what I mean? It's like um, you're, you're appreciating the absence of pain and you have to contrast it. You remember, you can still feel to some degree that pain that no longer is enslaving you or dominating you. This is the dilemma of the Bodhisattva that in appreciating shunyata, they have to remember and conjure what the opposite was, what shunyata has released them from, the suffering, the confusion. There's an analogy that's used for this on the Bodhisattva path. They say it's like a bottle of perfume. The perfume has been poured out. The perfume was confusion, was the unenlightened quality of the bodhisattva path. <laughs> we have a visitor somewhere. And when it's poured out, the bottle is now empty. So that's shunyata here. It's empty of confusion, empty of the belief in I and other. But when you hold the bottle to your nose, you can still smell the fragrance of the confusion. That's the thing with emptiness. When you first discover it, when the Bodhisattva first discovers emptiness at the level of the first Bhumi, the fragrance of samsara is still there, contrasting it. That's what allows the Bodhisattva to be so happy. He says, oh, I don't have samsara anymore. And he can remember, he or she can remember samsara and contrast it with what they've got now. And so the whole Bodhisattva path is a falling away of that watcher. The watcher is the one who says, oh, samsara is gone. I've got shunyata now, emptiness. That watcher is a subtle form of ego, an appreciator, unnecessary. The creator of the idea of progress on the path, all of which has to fall away. That appreciator falls away. The idea of progress falls away as one becomes more and more rooted in what is real, what is undeniably real. So what happens on the Bodhisattva path as the Bodhisattva progresses through the 10th Bhumis is that the watcher who's contrasting shunyata with confusion is falling away, is becoming thinner and thinner. And at the same time, the Bodhisattva is becoming more and more used to this world of reality, settling into it. And so what's happening is that the fundamental being of the Bodhisattva is changing. And at the same time, the way in which they relate to the world is changing. The way in which they relate to the world is described by what are called the transcendent virtues. These are the virtues that are take place within shunyata, within the absence of I and other. And so they're transcendent virtues, transcending ego. They're called paramitas, which literally means transcendent virtue. And there's a paramita associated with each one of these 10 bhumis. The paramita of the first bhumi, great joy, is generosity. That the person is so joyful at having awakened to shunyata that they become very generous. They don't care about holding on to things. They just give to whatever needs they're giving, whatever presents itself. And this generosity is without design, it's inspired by the joy of egolessness, of open heartedness. It has to do with celebration, celebrating the beauty of this world as it arises now and only now. The individual has stepped into a new version of the world, very, very different. And so they feel immensely inspired to give. And this is the paramita of generosity. 
The second Bhumi is called <clears throat> spotlessness. And by the way, you remember the five paths. The third path is the path of vision. The first two paths are preparatory. The third path is a path of seeing. Suddenly you see reality. It may only be a glimpse. It may be something longer. Who knows? But once that has been seen, truly seen, you can no longer maintain ongoing the, the myth. We keep falling back into the habit of our neurosis, but we keep remembering this. And so the act of remembering becomes the true act of meditation, of coming back to that view of reality, which is the fourth path. And these boomies, these 10 stages, are what happen on the fourth path, the path of meditation, as we come back to the view of reality again and again. And it's a deepening of that, a getting used to of that, of that view. So the second Bhumi, to go on, the, um, it's the, uh, it has the, excuse me. Yeah, so I'm just, my note here, the second through the 10th Bhumis are connected with the fourth path, the path of meditation. We are coming back to our understanding of what the real is again and again we wake up we come back to it and it begins we begin to shift our loyalty we've got these habits habits of neuro neurosis habits of worrying about i and other but we begin to shift our loyalty from those dreams into awake in the present moment here and now and that's the path of meditation which characterizes the second through the 10th Bhumis. So the second Bhumi, the Paramita, is the Paramita is one of discipline, Shila. Um, it really is, the discipline is of coming back again and again and again. And it cleanses the practice of generosity of any self-consciousness. We begin to let go of any kind of idea like I'm generous, I'm good, I'm virtuous. And you don't keep track of what you've done. You just are resting in the present. You act with simplicity, which is the key to helping yourself and others, both. Just simple, clear awareness now. He says in this chapter that uh, we are transcending the realm of the gods. That in the first boomy, there's a little touch of the realm of the gods. Now what the gods are is, um, pleasurable experiences. In fact, there are three basic worlds in the Buddhist scheme of things. There is what's called the world of desire, the Kama Datu. Kama means desire. Datu means world or realm or space. There is the Rupa Datu and the Arupa Datu. This is the formless world and the world of pure form. The Rupadhatu is the world of pure form, and the Arupadhatta, which is the highest, is the formless world. Now what happens is that um, the God realms, you see, are all built on pleasure. And we have a constant tendency um, to want to pursue pleasure. I'm just looking, I want to see my note here. These are called the dhyana states, meditation states. Um, the highest realms of these, the realm of pure form and the formless realm, are meditation states. You are, they're concentration states. You're concentrating your mind on an object. And they can be very blissful. This is very different from the joy of the bodhisattva. The joy of the bodhisattva has to do with freedom from suffering and the appreciation of this, the beauty of this world. The dhyana states are more like drug states, a feeling of pleasure that's induced by an external practice, a practice of focusing your mind, a form of intoxication, he says. And then he says, a kind of opium den. And in the boomies, you are transcending these kinds of escapist, pleasurable states, the use of meditation to escape into some form of pleasure. 
and you're transcending these, um, though the first Bhumi still has a faint connection with them. He says, in the first Bhumi, the feeling of joy and appreciation is still coming from a view of basic sanity, whereas there is actually very little joy in the blissful God realms. They're blissful, they're like drug states, like being drunk or drugged. In fact, um, Hindu meditation can lead very easily to these. Uh, Buddhist meditation is more careful. But you remember uh, perhaps reading about, or perhaps some of you even practiced, for instance, transcendental meditation, which talked about very blissful states that you could achieve through concentration on your mantra, mantra being a sound. You focus your mind one pointedly on it, and the more of one pointed you become, the more pleasurable and blissful it becomes. But these are temporary states, and they have nothing to do with the real joy of the bodhisattva. And then he talks about the Eightfold Path. Um, this is the path of the right um, view, understanding, speech, action, livelihood, effort, recollection, mindfulness, and meditation. And really, what this has to do, again, is coming present, out of the dream of I and other, into this world, a very different world. It's almost like uh, you're entering a capsule of reality. So right view of the Dharma is passionless. That means you're just seeing things completely as they are. You're not trying to pull it towards you or push it away, which are the two forms of neurotic behavior of the three poisons, remember? Indifference being the third. So right view has nothing to do with that push-pull of I and other. Right understanding is not intellectual understanding, it's but intuitive precision. You are right here, clear in the present moment. Right speech is gentle without aggression because there's no need for aggression of any kind. When one is caught up in the dreams of I and other, aggression fills our speech in the sense that we're constantly manipulating the our experience, our world, to benefit me. And that's the form of aggression that is transcended here. Right action is without ego, according to what's true and appropriate. So it's without them the machinations and lies and, and manipulations of ego, which is always trying to distort things and to interpret things in terms of this story about I. Right livelihood, it's not about money, but it's about confidence and balance in your daily existence. The confidence and balance is being present and taking care of things as they need to be taken care of. Right effort, um, it's without ego and it's inspired by joy. And it has nothing to do with pursuing goals it has to do with proper involvement with the activities and happenings of one's life and world. That one is so involved with them that you're just constantly, energetically, doing what needs to be done. Right recollection or mindfulness, the word for that is shmiti in Sanskrit. And it really is, sometimes it's called, you know, recollecting your your awareness, yourself, being mindful. And it's not self-centered or paranoid. It's spontaneous, it's just right here. We come back to it, awareness of this present moment. And finally, right meditation. The Bodhisattva is able to cut through the three worlds, the world of desire, which is the world of, of the six realms, starting with the hell realm, the hungry ghost realm, the animal realm, the human realm, the jealous god realm, and then the lower realm of the gods, it's called the Indra's god realm. Indra was the Hindu god of war. And then the second and third realms, uh, worlds, 
uh, that are cut through are the realms where pure meditation states, pure concentration states, let's say. The world, realm, the world of uh, pure form and the formless world. And so at the second Bhumi, the Bodhisattva is overcoming, among other things, fear. He, he or she has tuned into enormous power or energy, not afraid of being involved in taking responsibility for one's life. And you also begin to comprehend the meaning of the term Dharma Datu. And this is a term I'd like you all to be familiar with. Datu, again, means space, realm. Dharma is a word that has many meanings in Sanskrit. It can mean something that's divorced from Buddhism as social norms. It mean, can mean the Buddhist teachings, of, obviously. The Buddha taught the Dharma. But it can also mean existence. Um, and one stage of reality, we're not going to get into this, the Hinayana stage of the uh, philosophy of the world, uh, dharmas are things that arise and pass away in the moment. At the Mahayana stage, they refer to the six knowables. These are dharmas. They're like things that arise and pass, and they don't do it so fast, they don't even have any true being. Just like a, a gesture, it's gone, you know? This word is gone as soon as it comes out. These are all dharmas. And there are six main types of dharmas, which I've been talking about for a long time. The dharmas of sight, which are vision, uh, are, excuse me, are objects of vision, sights. The dharmas of hearing, sounds, of smelling, smells, of gustatory tastes, that's another, tactile sensations, and mental events. These are the main six kinds of dharmas, and they arise in this space. Just as when we meditate every day and we let rest our mind in space and there is this constant presentation of the objects of the senses as well as mental events those are the dharmas and what we are resting in when we come back into that space of awareness and are aware of these dharmas arising we're resting in the dharma datu the space of the dharmas it's also another term for reality. So it's another term, you might say, for shunyata. <coughs> shunyata, that word emphasizes the quality of reality, that it's empty of I and other. Dharmadhatu emphasizes the quality of reality, that it's full of the constant presentation of these six types of objects. In both of them, nothing exists just a constant flexing, coming and going, like mirages in the desert, like images uh, in, in a mirror, like reflections on water. Nothing has any true being. It's a constant changing presentation that's as gone as soon as you look at it. And this is the Dharma Dhatu. It emphasizes this aspect of space and fullness. So in right meditation, the, the really the bodhisattva is resting in the Dharma Dhatu. He says, you also begin to comprehend the meaning of Dharma Dhatu, the space of Dharma. It is a deepening of the Shunyata experience of the first Bhumi, in which you comprehend the simultaneous emptiness and fullness of this world of the phenomenal world as it arises now, empty of the dreams, the concepts of I and other, full of a constant and ever changing display of phenomena. Doubts as to the nature of reality are cleared away. That is the experience of Dharma Dhatu. And that is why this Bhumi is called spotless because you're actually beginning to see the Dharma Dhatu which is another version of shunyata. Shunyata is emphasizing lack of concept. Dharma Dhatu is emphasizing the fullness of experience within that lack of concept. 
He says the joyful experience of the first Bhumi leads to a sense of relaxation. And you understand complete, com the, completely the needlessness of fear. Isn't that something? That is needless. That's the word. <laughs> you don't need it. There are no dark corners. Your discipline is spotless and your experience becomes open, powerful, immaculate. You are full of awareness of this present moment. There's no room for fear. Fear is always about some dream of I and other and what that other is going to do to me, I. And that's gone at the level of the second boomy. The third boomy is called illuminating. And you begin to un demonstrate your understanding and discipline without tiring and without aggression. You identify with the teachings. You are tremendously eager to comprehend the meaning of Dharma Dhatu, the nature of reality, and Shunyata, which is all their part and parcel, those two things. You're falling in love with the Dharma, eager to learn it all. And the Paramita, the transcendent virtue, this is the way we, the Paramitas are the way we manifest, the way we behave in the world. The description of the Bhumi is sort of how we are, and the Paramita is what we do. And here, the paramita is one of patience. You're patient with yourself, your practice and study, and the understanding of the Dharma. He says, patience is a form of bravery. You're willing to jump in and let yourself uh, be soaked in the Dharma. You're willing to take a leap. I remember him, you know, all of these paramitas in these stages, you don't have to think of them as being somewhere out there in the future. You never really know where you are, you know, maybe at least at this stage. You don't know how much you've realized, but you can understand these ideas more and less, more as time goes on and you practice more and study more. And they begin to sink in and they are understandable right now. You can understand right now what this kind of patience is. I remember that in very, very early days, we we're all hippies, and a bunch of Rinpoche students came together. I've have, I've, have I told the story about the founding of the craft studio? Anybody? No? Barry, no? Well, a bunch of students came together and they were all craftsmen. They were making different things. I remember one person was making belt buckles to sell on the street and another person was making pot pipes out of antlers and another person's making leather clothing and and they decided that they had needed a place to work together where they could inspire each other and reduce the cost of and actually have workspaces and so they wanted to rep, rent together a bunch of them maybe 10 or 15 a large space and they would share it it was going to be called the craft studio and there was a meeting with Trungpa Rinpoche and what came up in that meeting was that the rent they fought was too high. And some of the people um, were saying, no, no, we can't afford this. We'll never be able to pay the rent. And Rinpoche kept saying, you can do it. You can do it. And he said, take the leap. You know, he kept saying to them, take the leap. And they, and they would talk about it some more and they'd worry about it some more. And at last, if they decided, no, no, it's just too much money. And he said, with a big groan, okay, that's all right. Don't take the leap. I'll love you anyway. <laughs> and this huge groan went up among the, all the people assembled. It was like listening to your mother, you know, I'll love you anyway. <laughs> and they did it. They took the leap. And that's what this is all about. You're taking a leap into living fully in this present moment, you know, beyond self doubt beyond fear for oneself. Instead, you are seeing and responding to, to the present situation accurately. Hmm. He says, patience is being without anger. It's the absence of a short temper. You are generous with the teachings. You're not bothered by students if you're teaching, not bored by repeating, nor are you discouraged by your own ignorance. 
that you keep wanting to learn more. This is the paramita of patience. And you begin to really experience the truth of the Dharma more and more. You need to personally test the teachings. And so the Bodhisattva at this stage of the path is sinking more and more into the truth of it. And then he says this is very interesting. You see, all of this applies to us, whatever stage we're on, whether we're still in the Hinayana or whether we're actually Bodhisattvas, who knows? And he says at the Bodhisattva level, discursive thoughts about such concepts as non-duality and egolessness are valid and encouraged. Your whole being is beginning to become Dharma. You begin to catch Dharma fever, to be obsessed with Dharma, even in your dreams. Everything becomes teaching. You are learning from what is happening around you. You are obsessed with that, which seems to be fine, which is really when we study Lojong, that's what we're doing. We're being obsessed with the Dharma as it applies to our everyday life. We read those slogans and we say, oh yeah, I can do that. I can try to do that. But I love this part, the discursive thoughts, which we usually say, oh, that's bad, you know, thinking again. But discursive thoughts about such concepts as non-duality and egolessness are valid and encouraged because they take us deeper. The fourth boomi is called radiating light, like rays of fire, which burn away any desire for further achievement, spiritual or otherwise, any desire for the Dharma. You see, we're beginning to realize that the Dharma is something that we settle into that's already here, that the teachings are already here. So we don't have to pursue them as though we're poverty stricken hungry and went down and don't have them. The Bodhisattva begins to see through even devotion to the Buddha, which can become another form of neurosis, of wantingness, of spiritual materialism, of trying to get more spirituality for me, for I. The paramita is the, the transcendent virtue is exertion. Sundru in Tibetan, Remember, it's virya in Sanskrit, energy, working hard. And basically, it comes from joy, that when you have this joy of being alive, then you're inspired with great energy to do all the things that you need to do. He says, you no longer regard yourself as a leader or important person and are willing to mingle with the ordinary folk a leader, an important person, that's a sort of egotism. And you give that up altogether. It has no place. The patience of the third Bhumi provides a lot of energy and power. And on the fourth Bhumi, you develop sharpness and penetration. You know how to handle your laziness and are willing to work. He says, you aren't thrown by sudden changes in your situation. You remain steady. The fifth Bhumi is called difficult to accomplish. And what this is, is about is um, he says that the Dharma Dato, this space of phenomena, which is what we come back to in awareness, becomes one with our basic being. It's what we are truly in this boomy things become so powerful that it is like holding a thunderbolt in your hand and not knowing what to do and here in this fifth boomy it's the paramita of meditation that brings everything together and calms it down samten is the word for meditation in tibetan dhyana in sanskrit and it produces a sense of comfort, of ease. You feel at home with your shamatha and vipassana. Your meditation becomes completely identified with your own experience. And you let welcome the cool boredom of meditation. You feel at home with it, and you continue to work on deepening the experience of shunyata. So you work with other people and you meditate as natural as breathing in and out. 
He says, at this moment you realize that others really are more important than you, which you didn't fully do before, in spite of having taken the Bodhisattva vow with that intention. He says, when you teach others, you don't act like a veteran who has come back from a war and is trying to tell everyone what it was like or what the truth is. That's a very handed, heavy handed approach. Here, the idea is that you should just provide a space or gap for people to come to their own realization. So the sixth Bumi is called Becoming Manifest means that the first five paramita practices or the first five bhumis are really becoming real now in the sixth bhumi. And this is the personal experience of prajna. Prajna is the clarity that happens when we come back into this world here and now. This clarity of understanding things as they arise, just as they are, without any interpretation. This is prajna and it's freeing. It frees us from the interpretations of I and other, of hope and fear, of wishfulness and fright. This is the personal experience of prajna, which is actually the paramita of this bhumi, the sixth bhumi. It's prajna. He says you have realized, you, you have, here you, are real, you realize more and more that the idea of abandoning samsara and achieving nirvana, a nirvana is meaningless. And in fact, that's more samsara, the idea that I'm going to get rid of samsara and achieve nirvana. The, what's all, the only thing to do is to settle into reality, the here and now. It says, finally, you end up nowhere from where you can really begin to develop a real comprehension of all the dharma. Here you can sharpen your intellect at the highest level of prajna. And in talking about prajna itself, first of all, while this is the paramita of this bhumi, the sixth bhumi, prajna has been developing from one, bhumi one, on. You can't have any of these bhumis without prajna. Prajna is really the faculty of clear seeing here in the present moment. Now, it's the driver of the first six bhumis. He says, prajna prepares you for all the remaining bhumis. It just sort of reaches, it's actually, it's not even its fullest development, but it's a fuller development at the level of the sixth. With supreme prajna, you transcend the ego of self and the ego of dharmas. You can relate with the phenomenal world intelligently without ego orientation. And then he says, and you do this by being coming present, of course. Prajna Paramita is the mother who bore the Buddhas of the past, present and future. This is right out of the texts that the Prajna Paramita is the mother of all the Buddhas. Shunyata, which is openness and endlessness. This world that we live in now has no beginning or end. You can't find it. It's open and endless. The non-existence of relative reference of both this and that. They're just fictions, lies, this and that. There's this open, endless, beginningless, dimension that we inhabit. Magic, from the point of view of ego. Sanity, from the point of view of a Buddha. Your meditation is the state of prajna, which is a very interesting state, <laughs> cutting through an eye and other. He says, before the sixth Bhumi, prajna is sort of passive. It is like an inactive grandfather sitting in the back and encouraging you to unmask. But this is from the first Bhumi on. But when you get to the seventh Bhumi, which is, we're coming to in a minute, Upaya, skillful means, then Prajna becomes more active. 
In the sixth Bhumi, Prajna is like the acquisition of weapons. And the Upaya of the seventh Bhumi is like having an army that could use those weapons to destroy the 20 mountains of ego. How about that? So from the sixth Bhumi onward, Prajna functions as a weapon or ornament. Now ego is completely bewildered, without a role to play, so it just slips back and becomes irrelevant. Because reality is dominant. One is resting in this state of awareness. So the fifth Bhumi meditation gives you a kind of solidity, a relaxation into this world with meditation. At the level of the, that's the fifth. At the level of the sixth Bhumi, there is both vision and solidness, joining Prajna and Shunyata. The seventh Bhumi, which is the last one we're going to discuss tonight, is called Far Gone. I want to say this too, that there are inflection points on this path points that are really important and more significant than the other points. So the first Bhumi is a tremendous inflection point, great joy, the discovery of Shunyata, the entrance into the awakened world. And by the way, when you enter into these Bhumis truly, they aren't temporary, they are permanent. That's what it says. So, the first Bhumi is an inflection point. Then we proceed to the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. The seventh Bhumi, which is the development of skillful means, is another inflection point, difficult to go through. The reason is that it has to do with going into action. That's what the seventh Bhumi is about, upaya. Upaya means skillful means, that one is acting in consonance with the Dharma, with the truth and embodying that truth in one's relationship to the world. And in going into action, you have to give up even more the watcher. You know how it is. If you're in action, you can't watch yourself as closely as when you're still. So as you go into action in the seventh Bhumi, there's a further giving up of the watcher, that one that's comparing and saying, oh, you know, I've, I've escaped from samsara. That has to be given up, it becomes more and more irrelevant. So that's why the seventh Bhumi is a little more difficult because there's a further giving up of the watcher. This is the last Bhumi in which the Bodhisattva has to go forward deliberately with diligence and effort, he says. That's why it's called far gone because you're surpassing this idea of going forward deliberately. Here the Bodhisattva has finally managed to destroy the 20 great mountains of ego. These are, if you want to read about them, they're in the Jewel Ornament of Liberation uh, by Gampopa. Uh, he refers to them as the 20 kinds of attachment to a self. You begin to understand that even the idea of non-duality, of no I and other, is part of ego's mountain ranges because we're trying to get somewhere. You begin to see through that falsification as well. As long as there is an idea of dharma as being truth that I'm going to hold, grasp, absorb, there's still an I. And so this is really beginning to settle into reality in which you give up the notion of personal accomplishment or self-aggrandizement. He says, paramita of skillful means, upaya, has two aspects, knowing your own skill and knowing how to use it, it's sentient beings. It's a state of total knowing, taken in, and it's part of your body, part of your basic being, like medicine you consume, which becomes part of you. This is upaya. The traditional metaphor for the seventh Bhumi is the spiritual friend. While medicine is usually associated with the sixth Bhumi, he says, you have to attack and kill ego, the heroic approach of the Bodhisattva, warfare and destruction of ego. Ego is always looking to get something. It is like launching an attack in which Prajna is the sword and Upaya is the soldier. 
Upaya is the way we do it. We, we practice, we meditate, we become present. We act in consonance with reality, which is described as the twofold egolessness, but that's just a description. And eventually, even that goes by the boards. You know, there's a Zen saying, in the end, there is no Dharma, there is no Buddha, there is nothing profound because we've given up the idea of profundity, which has to do with ego aggrandizement again. We've come back into true reality, waking up. When you wake up in the morning, there might be that moment when you wake up from dream and you had a nightmare, let's say, which like could be like waking up from samsara, and you go, thank goodness that dream was just a dream. This is what's real as you lie there in your bed and then you get up and you don't keep telling yourself that. You just go about your day, make breakfast, call your friends, do whatever you're going to do, go to work. This is the same thing in, on the path. We, in the process of waking up, there's a tremendous relief and joy in the first boomy. But eventually, we have to settle in and become real. Um, that concludes this talk for tonight. Next Monday, we're going to go through the last three Bumis, and I encourage you to do the reading. I mean, Trimpa Rinpoche is amazing in this. So helpful. And, um, and then we're going to start in on the third volume. <laughs> The introduction by Judy Leaf is good to the third volume. You might want to read it. I also want to throw th some things out there um, for you to think about. One is that I encourage you, if you wish, to discuss your meditation practice with me. Um, we're going into the third volume here. There are people, if you've taken the refuge in Bodhisattva vows, there are some people who are beginning to think about doing Nundro. Nundro are the preliminary practices, so-called preliminary practices. They're actually called the special preliminary practices, these practices. Um, and they're the entrance into the Vajrayana. And they are Vajrayana practices, uh, definitely. And uh, while they're called preliminary, they're very profound. Um, the great teacher, Patro Rinpoche, some of you might have, when we were at the Westchester Buddhist Center, we went through part of his book, um, The Words of My Perfect Teacher, and a commentary to it. He was a great teacher, Patro Rinpoche, and he is reputed to have done Nundro, this is pretty incredible, some, some 60 odd times. <laughs> I managed to do it once. <laughs> and. <laughs> Who knows? I don't, maybe I could do it again. But um, if you want to do Nundro, we should be talking about it. And we should be talking about your meditation practice. And um, it's the entrance into the Vajrayana in a more real way. Um, you have to have taken refuge in Bodhisattva vows. You also might, if you're interested in taking refuge in Bodhisattva vows, either one or both, they take place separately. Talk to me about it too and we can uh, make that happen. Um, and especially though, I'm interested in talking to people about their practice. It's very important. So if you have any inclination, we could do that on the Zoom. And if you're ever in Boulder, we could do it in person. <laughs> or maybe I'll get to the East Coast. The second issue is People keep bringing up the idea of a group in-person retreat. And um, I would be thinking about maybe a week, because by the time we get there and get settled in, a week is minimal. We used to do datans all the time. The datan is a month-long um, meditation, group meditation retreat. People could come for weeks, and some people would come for the whole thing. Uh, but I'm thinking at this point, maybe a one-week retreat, 
And I would like to hear from you if you're interested and feel that you could take the time. Here's one person who says, I say yes to group meditation retreat. <laughs> Thank you. If you could send me an email saying that you're interested, we would probably do it. Um, well, who knows? There are a number of facilities. We could do it at Chimbala Mountain Center, which is now called Drala Mountain Center here in Colorado. But a lot of you live on the East Coast, and there are some wonderful centers out there. There's the Wan Dharma Center, where the Westchester Buddhist Center did two week-long retreats. It's gorgeous. It's Korean. Um, and it was beautifully done. Uh, and there's also um, uh, Carmi Churling up in Vermont, um, which is a bit further up. Uh, Wan Dharma Center is about two hours from New York. And uh, Carmi Churling is about a five or six hour drive, although you can take the train. And um, so I'd like to hear about expressions of interest in this, doing a group retreat, and when. Just any, anything you can tell me, because I'll have to pick dates, and I'd like to pick dates that are most workable for people to take a week off and go sit with yourself and your mind. Rinpoche called retreat an opportunity to meet your own mind. And it's good. Also, um, generally in our Sangha, after having a lot of experience with solitary retreat, we developed a guideline for most people that um, you need to do a week of group retreat before you get permission to go into solitary retreat. Solitary is more challenging. But we do have people doing solitary retreats right now at this very instant in our Sangha, our little Sangha. So. So those are the two things you can get in touch with me about. And, and then we can have a discussion in the time we have left. Oh my gosh, I went long. And if we can't do much tonight with discussion, we can do it tomorrow. Okay, so everybody, but make it fast. <laughs> <laughs> it's like five minutes, I think. Yeah, really seven. Mark. Hi, wonderful. This is just great. <laughs> I was just looking at part of the reading and uh, I don't know if I'll get my point across too well, but uh, talking about uh, no beginning and no end and no middle, uh, nowness and endlessness are one. Uh, and a million becomes zero. And I guess zero can also be a million. And the moment, this is my take on this, the moment that we're in can also be infinite. Yes. And vice versa. Absolutely. And that's, that's just, so great. <laughs> that's great. Mm -hmm. And I also love the part about the middle way and uh, not the goal is not to run away from samsara and to run to nirvana that that becomes meaningless oh, yeah because reality is what is real dominates and we can't hold on to it but we can be part of it absolutely well said. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> that was a for the short time we've got. That was a great one. <laughs> <laughs> it's really well. Frederick has a hand up. Can you make it quick, Fred? Yeah. You know, like I was uh, as you were speaking, John. You know, I started to think about you know this gesture this primordial gesture of taking a leap and and like there's so many people out there that seem to be like doing this without realizing it you know, like with the great resignation you know i'd love to hear what your view is on that if we had time in this i have no opinion i'm not quite sure what what i'm supposed to have a view about 
I just see a lot of people taking a leap. And, um, and my, I guess my question is, can people take a Bodhisattva vow without realizing they're doing it? Or maybe it's like, in, I don't know, maybe it's more complicated than a five minute question. I think so. Hmm. And I have no idea, really. It's up to each individual. You know, we're taking a leap into the present, letting go of the past and future. There's a tremendous feeling of groundlessness that can arise. And beauty. What Mark was talking about, the infinite quality of this present moment without beginning or end. We all think of ourselves as having beginnings and ends, but maybe not. Just change. You know, Trimpa Rinpoche, in teaching about death, physical death of the body, said it's just another change, like the ones we experience now, moment to moment, year to year, day to day. Just another change. It just happens to be a bigger one. But there's always continuity in the change. It's like there isn't a cell in your body that was there when you were six. Every cell has changed. Complete change. And yet, when you look at a photograph of yourself at six, you can see the continuity. So there's continual continuity within the change. It's just that physical death is supposed to be a bigger change. You know, you can lose an arm, you can lose a leg, you can lose someone you love. But when you die, you lose the whole world and your body as well. And yet, there's going to be continuity within that change, too. Things go on. Yeah, and like what I'm kind of seeing in that continuity is just is taking the leap and like how Chung Yun Trump uh, emphasized taking a leap. There's something important about that. Yeah, oh, tremendous. I mean, think about it when you die. If you are unwilling to let go, holding on, death can be a real nightmare. Well, we got room for one more. Sorry I went over long, but this was such weighty material, such beautiful material, isn't it? Anybody else? I, I have a question. I, I, when you're talking about uh, dhyana states, I kept thinking about um, in Theravada Buddhism, they talk about the jhanas. That's Is, them. That's them? Yes. That's Pali for dhyana. Dhyana is Sanskrit. Jhana is Pali. Okay. Mm -hmm. Same thing. Because they actually look at that as something to pursue, like they call that the path of insight. To a limited degree, and there's a big difference in the Buddhist world about how far you pursue that. Um, in the, especially in the Tibetan tradition, you don't stay with it very long. You do it in the beginning, it's pure shamatha. And it has three virtues. One is that you begin to learn to the, ex the extent to which when one is lost in thought, because until you try not to think, you know, and become in awareness, you really don't realize it. And the second virtue is that you begin um, to develop the muscle, as it were, of beginning to, to realize that you're thinking and be able to come back to awakening. And the third benefit um, is that you get a rest from the anxiety of thought. Now you take that to an extreme and it can become very pleasurable. And in the Tibetan tradition, they warn against it. And there are lots of stories about yogis who got stuck in the dhyanas or the jhanas and might be meditating out in a cave. So Dilwil Kensei Rinpoche, who was a great teacher who died in the 1990 around there um, and was a close friend of Trungpa Rinpoche, was renowned, as were many other teachers, for going out and finding these yogis who had gotten stuck in the dhyanas or the jhanas 
and waking them up and saying, look, you're stuck. You get on with it. <laughs> you know? And they say, like in the, uh, um, the classic sort of version of this, they say that a yogi who gets stuck in the, in the dhyana, their body can completely wither away until all that's left is a palpitating heart and they're stuck in this trance state, right? This is the story, and, the, and they're the palpitating hearts in the cave, right? And the, the great teachers go out and they find these guys and wake them up. Oh, John, what the fuck does this have to do with anything? So anyhow, that, those are the dhyanas. But there's, you know, they, they are practiced a little more in some tra Buddhist traditions than others, but they're all regarded as temporary stages on the path in any tradition. And Vipassana or Vipassana is more much more profound. Vipassana is the Pali, Vipassana is the Sanskrit. Awareness practice. Which is really the the entrance into Bhumis. Awareness practice. Vipassana. Well friends and, we have... and so would you say John that the that the oh okay. Well to say no say it. What? Okay, it's quick. Yeah. Um, Vipassana helps to keep you out of the trance, or like, does that with Vipassana you can balance with the shamatha help? You can't be in a trance with Vipassana. Yeah, yeah, it's open panoramic awareness. Yeah, trance has to do open with in one's mind, the space. one pointedly on an object. One yeah. pointed. Okay, yeah, got you, it. You don't, you don't fall into a trance. It's something that happens as a deliberate practice of immersing yourself in that it takes a lot of work i would just before we close a couple people have been sending chat messages about the retreat could Great. you please email that information because the chat's going to go away when the session ends well i, I don't know if the chat does go or away. you could save you can save the chat i guess yeah, but email me too if you could please that'd be really helpful especially about that the retreat and talking about your meditation practice. Okay, so I'll put the chance up, Sarah, are you going to lead us? Yeah. And I'll mute all. Tomorrow we can have cacophony. We will close tonight with a prayer for peace and then by dedicating the merit generated by our practice for the benefit of all sentient beings. By the blessings of enlightened and compassionate ones, by the power of my positive actions of three times and my prayers of pure aspiration, may wars, conflicts, epidemics, and all other maladies dissolve in this world. And may the earth and all who live on this earth enjoy the abundance of well-being. May all learn to live lovingly with each other. By this merit, may all obtain omniscience. May it defeat the enemy wrongdoing. From the stormy waves of birth, old age, sickness, and death. From the ocean of samsara, may I free all beings. By the confidence of the golden sun of the great east, may the lotus garden of the region's wisdom bloom. May the dark ignorance of sentient beings be dispelled. May all beings enjoy profound, brilliant glory. Thank you so much, Jen. Thanks, Sarah. And thank you, everybody. Thanks, thank you, Sarah. Uh, thanks, Sarah. Thank thank you, everybody. Everybody. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you, John. Good night. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, everyone. Have a great night. Well. <laughs> that was great. Yeah. That was great. Thank you. Yes. This is yeah. such amazing material. This is a really beautiful dharma. Yes. It can be transformative in the instant. Ah, yeah. Yes. Anyway, to you, John. Hmm? Good night. Good night. Good night, everybody. Good night, Peter.